This is Dr. Purcell. Let's briefly go over the Turner Chapter 4 that discusses patient records, medication orders, and medication labels. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, so basic information. Medication orders are handwritten, which is the way it used to be, or more commonly, <clears throat> they're directly entered into a computer, and it's called computer order entry. Um, and you may hear that uh, abbreviated, or you may hear that a lot. Uh, it's a new uh, phrase, not new, but relatively new to healthcare. And it's where the provider, the prescriber puts the order into uh, the medical record via a computer that guides them on what um, they need to include in their order. And it doesn't let them put the order in if they're missing the, um, important vital pieces of information. Whereas a handwritten order, it's easy to forget sometimes as a human, and it's human errors, human you know, factoring, and they may forget to put elements in, which has led to medication errors. Computer order entry also overrides the use of abbreviations when ordering medications so that there's not confusion in that realm. And then the pharmacy, they get a copy of the order, they see it, and then you see it as the nurse because you will administer this. What the pharmacy's responsibility then is to make sure that medication or those medications get to the care unit where the patient is. So they have two different ways of doing this. They might have a, like a mini pharmacy located on a patient care unit that's controlled by a computer. It's locked, it has drawers. And the way it's opened is the user has to actually put in an ID and a fingerprint. I'm gonna show you a picture of what that looks like in just a moment. The other way is a unit dose uh, cart or medication cart and in their unit doses. So the doses I'm gonna use on my shift today for the six patients I'm taking care of would go into the drawers and then it's locked and so that someone can't just come by and open the drawers. And it's usually a code like one, two, three, four, a keypad up on, on there, or maybe even keys that get help you to gain access, but not for more than 24 hours in that cart, but in the, the mini pharmacy or automated medication dispensing unit, uh, you'll hear us call them the Pixis, that uh, they can put those in, they can put medications in there that can be for more than 24 hours. So this is your automated dispensing cabinet. The company named Pixis were, was the first one to come out with these. So oftentimes we just call it the Pixis. And what you see in this picture, underneath that computer screen, the laptop monitor there on the top left of your uh, picture is the gray cabinet below. Each one of those little squares is a drawer that opens. And even over here on the right, those little squares are individual drawers that open. And you can see for medications that are too small to fit in the drawers, they have bigger uh, areas with, with windows so that you can see through the glass and see where your medication is that you need to access. Down below here is a cart, medication cart. So let me look back up here on the top. You have to log in to this computer and then provide your fingerprint in order to get access to anything in the gray, purple uh, automated dispensing cabinet. Whereas down below, you have, um, I may be lying. Uh, yeah, this is also an automated dispensing cabinet. Um, it just looks a little different because you don't see the computer there, but this uh, place that looks like a key would go in there is probably where they put their fingerprint. This is just a manufacturer that I'm not familiar with, but when the drawer opens, and you see this is a long drawer and a deep drawer, whereas the ones up above in gray are gonna be long and skinny, this one is wide. So the drugs, see these vials in here and little, you see packages of, of uh, medication. This one with the purple highlight, I'm trying to circle it with my mouse, the lid actually popped open. It's clear acrylic. So there's a lid covering each one of these. So while you're in this drawer, you can only access the one that's open. And it's open because you told the computer which medication you needed up on the screen. And then the computer opened the drawer and up popped the lid. So that's where that medication is housed. You still have to perform your first check. 
you pull out that medication, you look at it and you look at the computer and you confirm that that's the drug you wanted to get. Notice please that all these little white papers with um, barcodes on them all look exactly the same. How easy would it be for the pharmacy tech who's loading this drawer frequently to put the wrong medication in the wrong slot? Very easy. So that is why even though it's preloaded and only one cabinet there pops open, you are still responsible for confirming that you pulled out the right drug. Over on the right side, you can see, you can even put little vials in there. So um, this is a medication cart that would only hold about 24 hours worth for a specific patient <clears throat> or specific patients. The one on the left in the hallway here has a computer attached to it and a keyboard. However, it is not attached, nor does it speak to these drawers like in the automated dispensing cabinet. Instead, you would log in and pull up a patient's medical record so you can see what medications are due. And in this, these little drawers, these are patient room numbers. And I may be going to this patient's room, the center top row middle drawer. And I pull that drawer out and I have taken meds from the automated dispensing cabinet and I've put them in there. And now it's time for me to give some of those medications. And so I type it in, I go to pull up that patient's medical record and I pull out the drugs. And now I'm gonna perform a second check to make sure that what I'm pulling out of there is what's actually ordered. And the one on the right, you're probably familiar with from our clinical lab. This is more like what we have there, <clears throat> excuse me. And again, each one of these would be for a specific patient. It could be a specific drug, but typically they're for patients. And on both, you'll see a place for a key. Right here on the upper right is a key for that one. And right again, on the right-hand side, top of the cart is a key for this one. Um, and that is how you access those. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm really sorry. So the single medication can prepare, be prepared in solid or liquid. Solid forms are granules, tablets, capsules, suppositories. Liquids would be um, things that are, let me see if that's on the next page so I don't get ahead. No, a liquid would be an elixir um, such as cough medicine. It could be a parenteral drug that we're gonna use a syringe to inject in an IV, sub-Q, intradermal or intramuscular method. The order must specify. Now, in this case, when we're saying solid or liquid, <laughs> it means, is it something the patient's going to swallow or something we are going to inject? Now, remember when we swallow, when it's something oral, it can be a tablet, a capsule, an elixir, but for IV, it's always going to be a liquid. And so in this case, when they say the form, they're talking about, um, are we going to, what, how are we going to give this? But oftentimes the provider or the prescriber isn't going to say if it's an elixir or a tablet, a tablet, a capsule or anything like that. As long as they say PO and you're giving it PO, then you're fine. If they say buckle or they say sublingual, that's how you have to give it. The patient can't swallow it. They have to have it dissolve in the mouth. There's two types of roots. There's non-parenteral, which is, means that we're not going to inject it. And there's parenteral, parenteral which is injectable. Non-parenteral includes patches like a nicotine patch, a fentanyl patch, um, all the ways through the mouth. It includes creams, lotions, ointments, suppositories. You cannot change the route. So acetaminophen can be given per rectum as a suppository. It can be given IV as an in, uh, infusion, and it can be given PO as an elixir or a tablet or a capsule. And if it's ordered PO, you cannot give it IV or suppository per rectum. If it's ordered per rectum, you cannot give it as an elixir, capsule, tablet, or IV. That um, is not something that you can change. So again, oral, mouth is swallow, 
Buccal and sublingual means they're going to dissolve slowly within the oral cavity. Buccal within the cheek, sublingual is under the tongue. Nasogastric is a non-parenteral route because it's going to go through a tube that's placed from the nose into the stomach. So it's injected that way and it bypasses the swallowing mechanism, but it goes into the stomach where there is, that is where absorption will occur. Enteric simply means it's a tablet that has a special coating on it, C-O-A-T-I-N-G, coating, um, to keep it from dissolving in the stomach and instead to, it passes through the stomach and then gets dissolved in the small intestine. And that's why it's enteric coated because for whatever reason for that drug, we want it to dissolve a little bit further down in the digestive process. Eye and ear drops are also considered non-parenteral. Gastric, which means we give it through a tube that's, that is, has been surgically placed through the patient's skin into probably the duodenum of the small intestine, that's gastric. Rectal, suppositories, topical skin, and vaginal. So these are all methods that are not parenteral. So it's not just oral that's not parenteral. It's all these others. Parenteral is probably the next slide. It is, and it's anything really that we inject. Epidural is into the spine. Hypodermic means it's being, being given with a syringe. I'm not really sure what they mean by hypodermic. But intradermal, we all do that when we go get our TB test. Um, intramuscular, intrathecal, again, is going to be in the space within the spine into the spinal cord. Intravenous is goes into the veins. Um, piggyback is also an intravenous route. Um, it's just a different way of administering. Subcutaneous means it's sub-Q like insulin right under the skin in the subcutaneous area. And then there's parenteral nutrition. So in Turner, if you look at page at the table in, four, ta in chapter four, table five, it lists some abbreviations uh, for terms that talk about frequency and times of medications. I say here to memorize those abbreviations in the table, but you really, really do need to be familiar with these abbreviations. You will see them. You will want to know them for your own shorthand writing and um, how they use. And then if you look at page 111, you'll see the Joint Commission's do not use list for abbreviations. Um, hopefully there's not any that are on both lists. I said to, to memorize it and then CJ uh, C says, don't use it. If you find any that cross over, let me know and we'll talk about why they might do that. The Institute for Safe Medication Practices is a, a website that is absolutely wonderful. And it is a great resource for you. And we will explore that in class. And one of the resources is your list of error-prone abbreviations, um, error-prone symbols, and dose designations. And I think it talks about those in your Turner textbook on these page numbers listed here. So we use the 24-hour clock in healthcare, especially when we're dosing for medications. And so there's a figure in chapter four. Uh, it's figure four, six that shows you what the 24 hour clock looks like. And we start with zero, 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 zero hours is midnight. And then zero, one, zero, zero is 1 a.m. and so on and so forth. And um, depending on where you work, their um, clock may run to a 2400 or a zero, 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 zero to denote midnight. That'll be specific to your institution. But um, it's very important that you understand military time and we will use that on exams. And I do have a, a video that I have posted to help learn military time. So a complete medication order has nine components. And if you are looking at a handwritten prescription, you will have to have all nine. If you're looking within a patient's chart, some of that will already be there, like the patient's name, for instance. So then you're looking at eight things and the date and time ordered are gonna automatically populate. The, the provider doesn't have to write that. It automatically populates when they open up a, a blank order page and say, I wanna order a medication. 
but on a written prescription, you have to have a date and a time that that prescriber has written that shows when they ordered this. So we have the name, the date and time ordered. Well, we of course wanna know what the medication is and best practice is to write the generic name. Um, what form should it be in? Should it be, um, okay, so let's say it is a oral route. They may order a liquid would be a form or a tablet. They, um, the prescribers form will not always be there. As long as they put oral or PO, not buccal or, or um, sublingual or any of the other methods, just oral, then the form is left up to pretty much the pharmacy or combination pharmacy and nurse to determine. Uh, but we can't change the route. So changing the form does not change the route. If the form is specified, you can't change it. If it's not specified, it can be determined by the pharmacy and the nurse. The total amount and the strength to be forgiven, to be given, so it's your dose. We wanna know the route. And we just looked at a whole bunch of them on a couple slides before that, non-parenteral and parenteral. So if it's non-parenteral, which one of those routes are we using? If it's parenteral, which one of those routes are we using? How often can we give this drug? And any additional instructions if needed. For instance, they ordered acetaminophen, 500 milligrams every six hours and as needed. Well, as needed for what? So anytime it's a PRN order, it means as needed. And you should have something to finish that sentence. <clears throat> Excuse me. If it's morphine, two milligrams, IV, Q, two hours, PRN. Well, I need to know when it is you want me to decide it's appropriate to give this. So they need to put PRN, pain, and they'll usually give a pain scale at that point for pain greater than five out of 10. Um, and then there has to be a signature. So there's a digital signature when the person, when the prescriber logs in and puts in an order and clicks save or submit, there's a digital signature that goes with that. On a handwritten prescription, you've probably seen before, we've pretty much all seen the prescription, right? The, the prescriber has to sign it at the bottom. And so if, if it gets to the pharmacy and it's missing your name, the date and time it was ordered or anything else on this list, except form usually, um, it will not be accepted. The pharmacy will either give it back to you, the person bringing it in, or call the provider to get uh, clarification. So labels, this is what's on your bottle, on your uh, paper, uh, little, you know, whatever your tablet is contained within. Um, it's what's telling you what's inside of what you're about to open. They must be read very carefully and very carefully compared to the prescriber's order before you prepare it. So your first check, you take it out of the dispensing cabinet and you look at what you have in your hand and what it says on that label and you compare it to the order from the prescriber. They should be the same. Next step is you're going to start to prepare that drug. And you probably have walked away from the cabinet at this point and are probably at the bedside and maybe got interrupted along the way or saw another patient first and then you're coming to this patient. That is why there's the second check. You're about to draw up the medication or you're going to open the package and put it into a cup in order to give it to the patient or something along those lines. This is now the second time you take that package and you compare it to the order. Make sure the drug you're holding and preparing is, has been ordered for this patient and what you're preparing is the correct dose and the correct route and it's the right time. And you'll do that three times at a minimum. Usually the dose um, on a medication label. So we're talking about, again, you're holding the vial, um, the bottle of pills or a vial of medication. It'll be on there and it's usually in milligrams per tablet for solid forms like acetaminophen capsules or acetaminophen tablets. It will say 325 milligrams per tablet or slash tablet or 
500 milligrams slash tablet or 500 milligrams per capsule. So you have to have, that's called the concentration. You have to have the dose concentration specified in order to know how much to give the patient. Because if they ordered 215 mil, no, they ordered 500 milligrams every six hours and you pick up the bottle of pills and every pill in there is a 250 milligram pill. In order to give the patient 500 milligrams, you will need to give them two pills. And the order from the, from the provider may not say give two pills. It says give 500 milligrams. So that is why you have to see the concentration um, of what, how much milligrams is in each one of those pills. If it's liquid, something you're gonna give IV or something you're gonna pour in a cup for the patient to drink, this is volume. So now it's gonna be in milliliters. It will say 250 milligrams of drug is in every one milliliter of fluid. So you're going to pour, and you need to get 500 milligrams. You're gonna pour out the, the elixir or the liquid into a cup. And if you only give one measured milliliter, you're only giving 250 milligrams. You need to give two milliliters to get to 500 milligrams. It's exactly the same as if you were gonna draw it up into a syringe and you need to give 500 milligrams Every milliliter is 250 milligrams. And how do you know that? Because it says it on the label of the vial. It will tell you how many milligrams of drug is in each milliliter of liquid. <coughs> Excuse me. And I mentioned the medication administration record or the patient's electronic health record. And these are a couple of examples. And the one on the left is really interesting because it will show you isn't this cool what your tablets should look like or what your capsules should look like? And that is um, unique to some EHRs or this is, looks like it's actually a printed uh, paper EHR that we might use in a long-term care residential facility where the people that are administering the drugs are not RNs. They're usually medical assistants and um, so they put this picture here to help prevent medication errors. And what the uh, person giving the drugs does is they read that, for instance, hydrocodone and um, let's see, APAP is, is um, Tylenol <clears throat> or acetaminophen. They're supposed to give a five milligram, 500 milligram PO tap. So this is a drug that has two drugs in one capsule. And, you know, that's probably not the best example, but it, we'll go with it. One tablet every six hours as needed for severe pain. And they show what the front and the back of this tablet look like. And the patient had pain in the afternoon at 4 p.m. So they're going to circle, oops, go back. They're going to circle the four in the afternoon. And the next time the patient can have it is six hours later at 10 in the evening. And so the patient has pain at midnight and they come over here and they'll circle the 12 under evening. And that's how they show that they gave those drugs. That's pretty rudimentary. In the hospital, it's much more complex. We are giving lots of medications to lots of patients. And the medications uh, um, that we're going to give are oftentimes require much more monitoring than the ones in a residential care facility. So then you'll have um, the, let's see, and they're not showing. So the electronic medication administration record, like on the right, you'll click boxes, you'll click on the drug. And what's really nice in most facilities now, if you don't know much about that drug, you can actually click right there on the drug and ask, and you can open a, a, a resource manual so that you can read about that drug and see if it's an appropriate dose, see what um, timing it should be given, uh, considerations for food, maybe it, it's not compatible with another drug that you're giving or things like that. You can look up right there in the computer while you're pulling the drug. You'll practice this much, much more. Trust me, when you get out of um, the, when you get ready to graduate, this will be very familiar to you. Um, let's just touch a little bit on how you're calculating dose when you're looking at a label and an order. So in order to calculate how much to give somebody, so that's a dose, 
you have to know how much is prescribed and how much concentration. Let's go right back to our example of an order for 500 milligrams, has, but you're holding um, a bottle of pills and each pill is 250 milligrams. So you have the prescribed dose and you have the concentration. How much drug is in each tablet or in each milliliter within that vial? Not reading these things correctly can lead, and this is often a cause of medication errors. So we were just looking at a couple different MARs. You'll hear it called the MAR, the Medication Administration Record. It is the official record of all medications given to a patient. And the best practice is to chart it as, as you're giving it to the patient. So that's the reason now we have computers pretty much in every patient room, or the nurse has a computer on a cart that they are taking from room to room so that while they are with that patient, while they are handing the drug to the patient, they are documenting that the patient has received it. The importance of this is that that prevents somebody else looking at the record and saying, oh, they didn't get this medication and coming in and giving the drug and now they've had two doses. Um, it also helps when we maybe um, later, hours later, something strange is going on with the patient. And we're wondering could, what, what medication did something could be a medication they took. And we want to pull up the MAR and see exactly what they've taken and how long ago, uh, what doses in order to figure out what's going on. As the third bullet here says, there are various formats. Some are in paper and some are electronic. So we have the rights of medication administration. And if you haven't already found this in your reading, you will find it. Potter will tell you that there's X number of rights of medication administration. Lily will tell you in one chapter it's five or six and in another chapter it's 11. Um, ATI will tell you different. It all depends on the situation and basically the drugs you're giving as to how many rights you actually need to invoke. But there's always the basic six rights. And you see how I've highlighted them going across here. And the, the six rights that you never, ever, ever change or go without are that you have the right patient, the right drug, the right dose, the right time, the right route and the right documentation. As we go to the seven rights, right now what it's adding is the right to refuse. And that is a new right that's been added and it's not wrong. It, it, that is a right, but I tell you what, the, the medication error is not gonna happen if you don't do number seven. The medication will error will happen if you don't do one of the one through six. That's where you put the patient at risk. So the patient does have a, a right to refuse. And that really comes under patient um, autonomy and patient rights more so than a medication uh, right because they can refuse anything. They can refuse certain tests. They can refuse physical therapy. They can refuse to be discharged. Uh, they can refuse to be in the hospital. So right to refuse is a universal right for patients. Nine rights. So we include the right to refuse. And now you're looking at, is, the, is this the right reason? And is the patient having the right response? Now, the right reason really goes to those PRN drugs for you as the nurse. Am I giving this for the right reason? For the other drugs that are ordered um, to be given you know, every day or every 12 hours or every six hours, you should understand as the nurse why they're getting it. It should make sense to you why they're getting the drug. However, there are times when prescribers need to, will order a drug that's um, off label, or you may not understand why it's being given. And if you don't understand why it's being given, that is absolutely a conversation to have with the prescriber and say, you know, I'm trying to understand. I've never, you know, this patient doesn't have diabetes, so I'm not sure why I'm giving insulin, right? That's just an example. Um, but it doesn't have to happen in every time you give the drug. And then the right response is something as a nurse, you should always be evaluating the therapeutic response to any intervention you have done. Now we have the 11 rights. This pertains to drugs that you are giving IV, 
I am, it's the parental role drugs. So now you have that right to refuse, the right reason, the right response, and now you're holding a syringe and you pulled up two milliliters of a drug and you're going to inject that into somebody's IV and it's going to go into their blood system and immediately become active. 100% bioavailability and immediate onset. You, when you push that plunger and push that drug, some drugs you have to push over a very slow period of time because of the way they, the body reacts when they receive the drug and other drugs can be pushed very quickly. So that is the right rate. You have to look that up in a book. What is the rate that I can push this drug? And then the right diluent. Some drugs you have to dilute with uh, some normal saline or you have to dilute them with some dextrose and water before you administer them through the IV. You'll learn more about that in level three, but that's why there's so many different levels of rights. For our course, for this class, they're the basic six that you never ever change or do without. Oh, and that's our 